nation for what promises to be a uh, exciting, important, timely, and meaningful conversation. Curators in conversation, tell me what you remember, uh, which brings together our two exhibition artists, Sue Williamson, Lebahang Hanye, uh, in conversation with our exhibition curator, Emma Lewis. I won't steal any thunder from my colleague, TK Smith, but I do want to thank you for being a part of our opening programs and our celebration. I would like to welcome all the Barnes members that are uh, here with us in person. I also should take a moment and thank our virtual audience for being with us uh, this morning. So without further ado, I please ask you to join me in welcoming to the stage a new colleague to the Barnes Foundation who's landed and made uh, his presence and contributions uh, very memorable. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, my colleague TK Smith, Assistant Curator of Art of the African Diaspora to the stage. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. I have a very short statement that I'm going to read for you, and then we can get on with this conversation. Why is the Barnes hosting this exhibition? Tell me what you remember. The Barnes Foundation is a cultural institution with an international reach. The collection we steward holds artworks and objects spanning from antiquity to the 20th century, with origins from various corners of the world. We introduce to our local audiences, our community, to scholars, to programming, to exhibitions, with the hope of mutual growth, our growth as individuals, as a cultural institution, and our hope to grow a wider reaching and inclusive appreciation for the arts, as is in our founding mission. As is indicative of the creation of my position, Assistant Curator Art of the African Diaspora, we are going to address some of the long awaited needs and desires predicated by the collection itself, such as furthering our critical engagement with African objects in our collection, as well as African histories, the work of African scholars, and of course, contemporary art created by African artists and those that make up the African diaspora. This exhibition offers us the opportunity to tell just a few South African stories, both painful and healing through the artwork of two exemplary art makers. And in telling those stories, we are reminded that they're not so different from our own. Um, just to echo the sentiment of my colleague James from last night, this exhibition is so much about elevating the voices of women, the women who make this artwork and the women who have lived and worked with these women, who have raised these women. Um, as it is Women History Month, we just want to honor these women who are here with us, as well as the various women whose voices they amplify through their work. Tell Me What You Remember is curated by Emma Lewis, a modern and contemporary art curator who specializes in photography, specifically photography done by women. She is currently the curator at Turner Contemporary in Margate, England, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Emma Lewis, Sue Williamson, and Lebo Hong Hanye to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, could you raise your hand if you cannot hear me very well? If you, sorry, raise your hand if you can hear me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Good start, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, express sincere thanks, sincere thanks to everybody at the Barnes Foundation because we know it takes a whole village to make an exhibition. Um, but I would particularly like to thank um, my new colleague, TK Smith, who has really been the most gracious, thoughtful, um, an incredibly hardworking colleague over the past few months to to bring this exhibition into the world with, with Sue Liberhang and I, and also to James, who wrote from the very first meeting many, many months ago, has brought the most um, kind of exciting um, original ideas to, to engage and um, amplify this exhibition in ways that we couldn't have imagined, but are so much kind of richer um, and, and more extraordinary than we could ever have hoped. So thank you both. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask Sue and then Lebo Hang to walk you through some of the works that are represented in the exhibition. Um, but first, let me um, just give you their biographies in brief. Sue Williamson was born in 1941 in Litchfield in England and emigrated with her family to South Africa in 1948. In the 1970s, she began to make work that addressed social change, and by the late 1980s, she was well known for her series of portraits of women who were involved in the country's political struggle. 
that body of work is titled A Few South Africans and photographs that went into their making um, can be seen on the walls today as the series All Our Mothers. Sue is the author of two books, including Resistance Art in South Africa and South African Art Now, and her work is held in many international collections around the world. She's also exhibited globally and um, is shown most recently in her solo exhibition Between Memory and Forgetting at the Box in Plymouth, which is on the south coast of England. Lebohang Hangye was born in Katlehong in Johannesburg in 1990 and received her introduction to photography at the renowned Market Photo Workshop in Johannesburg in 2009, where she completed the Advanced Photography Programme in 2011. She obtained her Diploma in Fine Arts from the University of Johannesburg in 2014 and is currently completing her Master's in Fine Arts at Wits University. Her work is also held in many collections around the world and she's a recipient of notable uh, awards, most recently the Foam Paul Huff Award of 2022, which has resulted in her current solo exhibition at Foam Museum in Amsterdam. Both artists have shown to different degrees in the US, but this we're very proud to say is the most um, in-depth presentation of their work in the United States to date. This has been a project that has been several years in the making, a few years in the making rather. The invitation to curate an exhibition for the Barnes proposed an exhibition came at the end of 2019 from Dr. Nancy Ierson, Deputy Director here at the Barnes. Um, and at the time I was a curator of modern and contemporary art at Tate Modern, specialising as TK kindly mentioned in, um, in representations of women's histories, uh, feminism or feminisms, and how to complicate how that's represented in Tate's collection. And it was broadly speaking through that research that I encountered Sue and Leberheim's work. At the same time, I was also developing a strong interest in oral history and really struck by how oral history and photography share this very particular but very complicated relationship to the idea of truth and documentary and evidence. And that's something that working with both Sue and Leberhang has really um, enriched for me personally and I hope will for you as well. There were two bodies of work that, um, that I had in mind when the seed for this idea was planted. One was by Sue, um, entitled No More Fairy Tales, and explored different generational attitudes to the, um, between those who experienced the years of apartheid and those who are born in, between, in the period of the transition to democracy and who fall under this um, very loaded term, born free. The other body of work by Leberhang called Kalafalaka and really saw her explore, um, the, uh, begin her journey of tracing her maternal ancestry and again saw her um, bridge that generational gap through conversation with the elders in her family, particularly her grandmother and aunts. So here then were two artists who are both exploring from their respective position, memory, experience, knowledge, identity, and, and how all of those things are transmitted from generation to generation. And also questioning and, and problematizing the role of the artist in that. As our own conversations developed over the past couple of years, the focus of the exhibition expanded beyond that of the intergenerational conversation to take in other forms of oral histories. So within the exhibition, you will see praise poetry, stories, formal statements, audio recordings, transcriptions of audio recordings, many different ways that the artists capture and represent voice or the idea of voice. And so it became really clear to me, as it has, I think, between Sue Leberhang and I in our conversations, that both artists are really convinced of the importance and the urgency of collecting living memories before time passes and it becomes too late. And it's a concept that I think um, resonates just on a human level. This idea of having those conversations while we still can, of asking the difficult question of, kind of, of going there. Um, and so there is a certain universality, I think, to this message. But at the same time as the, there is a wider resonance, there is um, a, a context specificity here that is so important and urgent even, because clearly each of the works in the exhibition speaks specifically to the apartheid era, the post-apartheid era, even with Leberhang's works, works that speak far into their imagined future as well. And so, they both, they here are two artists that are both exploring the social, political, cultural histories from the perspective of the personal and the familial within a, um, South Africa today. And they are histories that I think it's important to say they may have experienced themselves, but also may not have, and that's something we can perhaps touch on in our conversation. 
lastly, just to say that something, well, plainly, really, you'll see in the exhibition um, that Sue and Leberhang's works are very different. And so, in thinking about this exhibition um, and the catalogue that accompanies it, we, myself, the artists, uh, the institution, really wanted to take on the complexity of that exchange as we created a cross-generational structure. Um, I think that's enough from me. I'm now going to um, kindly ask Sue to uh, walk us through her works in the exhibition for the next 15 minutes or so. Same with Leber Hang, and then we'll have a few, we'll have questions between us before we turn over to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Leber Hang. I'm delighted to be here at the Barnes exhibiting alongside Leber Hang as curated by Emma, and thank you very much for coming this morning. It's my pleasure to take you through some of the work. Well, we don't want to look at me again. This is one of the works from a series called All Our Mothers. All Our Mothers in this sense being the um, generation of women who pulled South Africa through apartheid, struggled for liberation. This particular portrait is Caroline Matsualedi. She was the, um, well, she was the wife of one of the, the Rivonia trialists of, um, alongside Nelson Mandela. He, her husband was jailed for 27 years and she was left behind. This is the second time I photographed her. Actually in the top right hand of the photograph you can see the post of the men who were, tri who were incarcerated that famous child. Her husband is right in the corner. This is Annie Salinga, who was a fa famous for refusing ever to carry a pass during the apartheid years. She's photographed here outside her house in Jungle Walk. I knew Annie through being, she was also a member of this organization, the Women's Movement for Peace, which was a, um, a multiracial women's organization in Cape Town which was formed in 1976 to try and do whatever we could in many different arenas to just try and change things. Um, this is a work called Last Supper at Manly Villa and it probably, it's, it's a story of District 6 in Cape Town, District 6 being a very beautiful little area, um, a residential area which was situated on the banks on the um, slopes of Table Mountain, but in the 1960s, the apartheid government announced that they were going to knock it down. They called it a slum. They said that they were going to move everybody out and redevelop the area for whites. And um, this series of photographs were taken all in 1981, except for the last one. And it reflects the, a day in District 6, the last day that Eid was celebrated and that's Naz Ibrahim leaning on the wall of her house. As I took the photo, I turned around and there were school children walking by, so there was still life in District 6 at that stage, and neighbors are coming in, and the day is being celebrated, but an eviction notice has been handed out that very day. The eviction, a copy of the eviction notice is here at the bottom telling Naz and her family that they have 30 days to move out. And Naz is written on the wall of her house, Welcome to the Last Supper. And I was actually collecting also material for an uh, installation at that stage, um, which was going to be just the rubble of District 6 surrounded by six of Naz's dining room chairs. And this is Naz against her piano. By this time, this is a week or so later, everybody has written their messages on the wall. This was some years later, this was 1996, so 15 years after the demolition, it was part of a public sculpture um, exhibition in District 6, and I've just done the framework of a house with an old window, and on that window is engraved the scene that you would have seen if you'd still been in District 6. And um, here we have another piece around District 6, this is, now this is 1993, and I told you the first exhibition I made was using rubble. These are the tiny little scraps that were left by 1993, scraps that were lying still in the ground, just under the surface. And little flakes of paint, a Barbie doll shoe, plastic rice packet, and these 
little blocks. Well, it's called Mementos of District 6. That was all that was left of the community. This piece is in the collection of the Birmingham Museum of Art in Alabama. And, but you see it here in Sala Una in Rome. So it's both a house and a little chapel of remembrance. This is a piece that you will see on this exhibition. It's called The Lost District. And this is a final piece about District 6. And um, it looks much better here at the Barnes than it did in its first showing here in London. So I'm happy to say that I'm absolutely delighted with the way it looks here. And these windows that you see are as if the, you're standing at a window in a house in District 6, but the windows explode. You're looking at a view, but as you're looking at it, the window is exploding away from you. And I've engraved images from old archival photographs into the glass, and they cast a shadow. So you see the busy shopping streets, the life of the, 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 the little district, but it's just a shadow on the wall. It's gone. And there I am in my studio. It's not hard to engrave with an engraving needle, but it is quite time consuming. But I thought people might just be interested in the technique. This is a work called A Tale of Two Craddocks. This is a detail. It's the story of one woman, Yomeka Ganiwe, and her husband, who is an activist and who was killed. That's the work. If you stand on one side, it's called A Tale of Two Craddocks, Craddock being a small town in the Eastern Cape. If you stand at it from one side, you see the story of the city of Craddock. Well, not the story, but the tourist guide, what you can do if you go. You can play bowls, you can go to church, you can send your child to school, but it's all for whites. And if you look at it from the other side, you see the other side of the hill where the black township is hidden away from the white, white town and the story of the Ganiwe family. Some of the photographs I took and others are taken from press or other sources. This is a series called Truth Games, which recorded some of the cases which came up before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, which was formed when the new government came into power in 1994 and it was decided that the country, what the country needed as a form of healing was to try and discover the truth of all those shadowy cases that we really hadn't known about. That would, well, we knew about it, but we just knew that somebody had disappeared, couldn't be found, was allegedly had left the country, but we knew that that wasn't really the whole truth. So it was an experiment to try to to bring healing to the country, and it, it took place in all over the country in courtrooms, the group of commissions traveled around, listening to people bring their, bringing their stories and trying to find out the truth of all of them. So in this series, there, I've, there are three images and each side on the left, there's the person who's asking the questions, the, the incident in the middle, and on the right, the person is answering the questions. And all of these, more you, one can find more about these on the Barnes Focus website. Um, there's three of them on the wall. They're in the Goodman Gallery in London, but there are 13 in the series altogether. I think what's interesting about the series is that it shows a whole reflection of emotions. In some cases, reconciliation is, is reached. In the centre one there, Neville Clarence tells the man who has ordered the bomb which has blinded Neville Clarence, that he understands that it was just part of the struggle at the time. He forgives him, they shake hands. Abu Bakr Ismail says that he had to do it, it was part of the, part of the struggle, but he's, he's sorry that Clarence lost his sight. So sometimes there's a recognition, and in one of the ones that we, we have here on the show, there is that recognition. Other times, the person who's lost a family member feels that they can never forgive. A small piece called um, Memorial to the Truth and Reconciliation of Commission of South Africa. It's a memorial, it's standing on a little plinth. And the words that came up most frequently during the commission hearings, the perpetrators who said that they can't remember, they can't remember why they drove to this house, why they dragged somebody from under, whatever and the people who are asking the questions and they can't forget. And the words sort of 
drop down as if they're falling into memory. And this is one of the video pieces which Emma mentioned earlier that particular morning. Sia and Gaduka is in a first time conversation with his mother on the subject of his father. And that particular morning is, is the morning that the, um, the police knocked on the door of their home and told his mother that his father had been killed in a bomb in a bomb blast. And he's able to, it's, it's been a, a family not spoken about in the family all these years and he's now in his 30s and he's asked for the first time on camera and he hears exactly what happened. I think that's perhaps the last one. Uh, this is the Suwani family from Soweto, one of the others in this series. It's called What is this thing called freedom? Which is the question that the youngest member of the family, Vushlebeswe Suwani on the right is asking questioning. By this time, there's a real sense of disillusionment in South Africa. Nothing much has changed. The syllabus in the university is still very colonial. The students cannot afford to go. Many of them who would love to go to university can't afford the fees. And um, Bukhli Bezwe is addressing these questions. And at the same time, she's hearing from her grandmother, Joyce, on the left, and her mother, Bully, what their experience of apartheid was. So you have two women who went through apartheid and one who is from the new generation. And that's just from the beginning. It's a um, photograph of Bukhli Bezwe against a protest in which she'd participated, in which the students marched to parliament to ask for free education. And now I'm going to hand over to Lebochan. Oh, you've got a mic. <laughs> um, thank you, Sue. Um, so I will start with one of my recent bodies of work, um, In Search for Memory, which is one of the works that you see um, soon after you enter the exhibition. And this work, I think, different to the other works in the exhibition, is not around my family history, but is, um, is a work that I started during COVID. And I had been introduced to a book by a Malawian writer, um, uh, Tao River, and what that means is Dada Forever. And, um, and it's basically, um, Nelson Mandela was called um, Tata, which was sort of father of the nation. And, um, and so in this book, it's, it's a sci-fi novel. So in the book, he sort of is looking at the past, the present and the future and imagining um, a different kind of South Africa. And so it's, it's, it continues the theme that, um, that I work with in my, in my family, in the research around my family history and sort of thinking through um, the legacy of apartheid, um, particularly as um, as it relates to families, and in this book, he's you, um, he takes us on a journey of this young man who witnesses his father getting killed during apartheid, and um, and years later encounters. So they're on the farm of this um, of this white man where the family was living and working on. And he witnesses that as, as a seven-year-old, and then years later, I think when it's post-apartheid, um, and he's in his 20s, encounters this man, and he kills him. And, um, and then years later, um, this is basically sort of South Africa in the future, when Nelson Mandela returns, um, and he, um, he sort of finds South Africa um, burning, and the only thing that's remaining is, um, is his statue in the Nelson Mandela Square. And so I found that I found this novel interesting. First of all, because it was written also by a Malawian writer um, who's not from South Africa, but it was really touching on questions that me as a South African, as a young South African, called the sort of born free generation, um, were really sort of questioning around um, family structures. Um, again, the absence of fathers, um, but also just the legacy of apartheid on the day to day. In, in South Africa. And so this is, um, so the work is, is created as these sort of small cardboard cutouts and, um, and, and, the, and then I place them in like a, in a diorama. So also referencing um, sort of 
theater, theater models, um, you know, referencing also set design and shadow play. So I play with this idea of, um, of these items or these elements that are able to be movable. Um, also, again, speaking to this idea of um, history that's not fixed, um, of um, a story that's not fixed or memory that's not fixed. And this is in the studio during the construction of one of the scenes for In Search for Memory. And so this work is really where um, the research around my family story started. Um, so this work was made in 2012, 20, between 2012 and 2013, and it's called Gilefalaka, Her Story. And it's a work that, um, that I started about two years after my mother passed on. And I was looking through the family photo albums, um, specifically my mother's photo albums, and had realized that a lot of the clothes that she was wearing in these photos were still in her wardrobe. And these are photos that were, were taken of her when she was around the same age that I was when I started this project. Um, and as you can see in this image, so in the image you see me as a, as a one-year-old baby, and then you see me um, as a 22 year old, um, and then you see my mother um, when she was around around the same age, maybe 29, um, and I'm in the same clothes that she was wearing, and I've taken um, the photo um, in my grandmother's yard, which is where she had had this photo, or where we had had this photo taken. And I think different to the other images in, in the series, this is one of, I think it's only two of them where you see me, appearing twice in, in the image. So again, it continues some of the themes um, seen in In Search for Memory around time um, and this idea of the sort of past, the present, and the future, but also speaking very much to um, that photography also has the ability to, to do that, but also themes around, um, around loss um, and exploring that through the medium of photography. Um, but also the idea of this, this double and speaking to, um, I'm just thinking of the book of Jack Derrida who's um, around ontology and he speaks about the sort of double loss that takes place when you lose someone that you love. And so, you know, when I, when I started making this work, I didn't, I didn't think that the work would, um, I didn't really think of it as becoming a, a body of work and so it, it really happened quite organically. Um, and, you know, and so as it developed, I mean, initially it was, I'd imagined it as sort of two images that live alongside each other. And then as the work developed, I then created one image from these two images. Um, and, okay, not working. Um, and so Musebet Zwadiriti becomes one of the newest works, and it's in the first room that as you enter the exhibition, um, which is the room where both myself and Sue Williamson's works are together um, in the exhibition. And Musebet Zwadiriti, which means the work of shadows and what becomes a sort of continuation in the research um, around my family history, is the use of the Susutu language. Um, and so with all the titles that are for works that are around my family, all of those are in Susutu, um, because the work also to a large degree is exploring um, the erasure of languages, the erasure of names, um, because the work really started with me going on a search around the family name. And so Musebe Zwadiriti is, um, is a work that still continues working with the family photo album um, in the sense that I, I've extracted images um, from the family photo album and then um, created these um, larger than life fabric works from, um, using sort of small pieces of cotton um, to create, to recreate these, these images. And these are images of my grandmother and great grandmother. And my grandmother, my grandmother's one is central in the sense that um, that it appears, or even my, my great grandmother, it appears in a lot of the other works um, that you'll see in the exhibition in different ways. Um, but also my grandmother was the one who narrated all of these stories around my family history um, before I then started the journey of tracing the rest of my family and, um, and doing all of these um, interviews and research around the family history. 
And in the first, um, when I first started the research in 20, 2012, um, I traveled. I traveled around the country trying to locate my family with from stories that my grandmother told me, and she also helped me locate some family members that I'd never met before. And it, um, you know, the research was really centered around the family name. Um, and somehow it ended up becoming about my grandfather because he was the first one to move to the city. Um, so he refused to work um, on the farms and he, he wanted to seek out like, better opportunities for the family. And so he moved to the city and this is during apartheid. And, um, and years later when my family was able to move to the city, when, um, you know, when black families could move more freely, um, this is towards the end of apartheid, and then my, you know, then my family Different, this was before I was born, so different family members lived in his home, in his home before finding their own homes and before finding jobs. And so he becomes quite central in the family narrative in that sense. So this um, video piece that you'll see in, in the exhibition is these stories that I was basically being told about my grandfather. And so I'm wearing a suit similar to the one that he was wearing in the photos that I have of him because I'd never known him, but only through... Um, these four photos that I had of, I had of him, and um, and in the photos he was always wearing a suit, um, and I also got to know him through the stories that my family was sharing with me. And so the photos are taken from the family photo albums, um, and then I then create these these sets in my studio and um, and basically perform in front of these cardboard cutout sets as my as my grandfather wearing a suit. And so Mutlokomidwa Tora is a work that really continues some of the questions that um, I'd started to work on from the, the video that I just, the video still that I just showed. Um, so Mutlokomidwa Tora um, means lighthouse keeper. And it's, um, so as you'll see in the front, it's an image of my grandfather again and um, in a suit. And again, it's taken from the family photo album and some of the other images also um, of the people in the, in, the, in the story are also taken from the family photo album. And it's, you know, this is one of the, the four stories that I sort of chose for, for this installation. And this installation is large cardboard cutouts. Um, and I mean, when I started the work from, from the previous series, I become really interested in set design and the idea of being able to sort of create a whole world with cardboard cutouts. And so, um, and so this becomes these, this, these four stories that relate to my family name, um, Khanye, which means light. And because I've noticed that we, our family name was spelt in these three or four different ways, um, I then went on the journey to sort of try and find the correct spelling or the correct name. Um, and so this is this, these, dif these different stories that I then um, collected from the family as they relate to the family name. Um, and so it's got two scenes from the city and then two scenes from um, the village as um, it's sort of these four different stories that, um, that I've collected from different family members. Um, this is from an exhibition, I believe, in, I think it was Box's Museum. Um, but it's, um, it's basically how, similar to how you'll experience the exhibition. And then this is a work that's the last work in the exhibition currently, Dipina Zakhanya, which means um, Songs of Light. And I was, um, I was also, so in, in this research around the family name, I was interested in um, a sort of oral tradition um, that's specific to South Africa, um, which is something called Diretto, which is um, like a praise poem that each black surname has. And so this was, this is something that, you know, you would recite at a funeral um, or at a wedding, or sometimes when you're doing like a ritual and are sort of trying to summon your ancestors. And so 
directors also what um, how families were also documenting their family history and their clan names um, and so I was quite interested in um, in the sort of oral tradition so you know over the uh, over the last sort of few years uh, um, doing this research and recording my family members um, a lot of my aunts um, and families have recited that to me. Um, and so this video piece becomes a continuation of this research around Diretto. Um, and what you'll hear in, in the exhibition, because the three channel video installation is, um, is that this, this praise poem is, is recited by my aunt in the background, but also um, we've, um, we have a composition um, of, of a sound that is of, um, of a song um, a ja with a jazz musician that I, that I worked with or collaborated with, Tandin Duli, um, who composed um, a song um, in relation to this recitation that my aunt is doing. And so in the piece, it's also about this idea of, um, you know, lighthouses, but also the history of lighthouses um, and how they were you know, they were meant to get people to home safely, but also how they also were quite um, symbolic in, you know, in how water was being used for slave trade and for a very violent history. And so in, in this video piece, it's this idea of also me um, continuing my research of the family name, taking care of the family history as I'm taking care of this lighthouse as a sort of female lighthouse keeper or an imagined female lighthouse keeper. And this is one of the film stills um, from the film um, of me cleaning this bulb and taking care of, of the light. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we have about 20, just over 20 minutes left. I have a few questions for you both before we um, before we'll turn the mic over to you in the audience. Um, I'd first like to ask about um, your, bring this back to the materials and your practice as artists, because it's impossible to talk about your work and to talk about this exhibition, tell me what you remember, without talking about the social context and the histories, but you are engaging with material first and foremost as artists. And something that we can see through, um, through your work suit and in, in your work, Lebo, is, is the trace is how um, you engage with voice differently, not only amongst one another, but between, in your own works, in each body of work. And I'd like to ask you what you found are the, um, the opportunities, but also the limitations of, of material media with um, capturing, carrying, representing voice. Well, I think that one can never, never actually capture more than a small portion of what you, what the, the whole picture is. Um, I mean, I think it's perhaps most evident in, in my work in the Truth Game series, in which these enormously complex cases have been portrayed just in three simple images of the face of, of the person asking what had happened, the person who's answering those questions and the few words that I've taken from the press, which slide, which are supposed to slide across to, as you try to reconstruct or imagine the background of the story itself. So in a sense, it's only a, what should I say, a marker of that case. If you really, you, you can accept it as something that you can look at at the time and think about, but it might be that you'd want to go and investigate much more about it. And, and that's true of all of them. I mean, the, the work about District 6, it, it shows some of the, the streets that you, some of the street scenes that you might have seen in that work, The Lost District. But you can only just suggest, if they, you can only suggest, it's just like a, a lens on a wider world. Um. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, I think when I started, when I started working with the Family Photo Album, um, what really struck me was how 
it seemed quite fantastical. So it it um, it didn't seem like it was really um, a space for the family history per se, as it really was like a space for the family fantasy. Um, in the sense that with all of the photos that um, of my mother, which were many that um, in her in her photo album she was always dressed up and so she was basically in like her Sunday best and there weren't any photos of her in her factory worker's uniform. I mean, she worked as a factory worker, I think since she was 20 and up until she passed away. And so I became really interested in how and what the function of the, the photo album or the family photo album really was. Um, and, you know, it being a a space that that speaks to a memory but to a large degree really is a, is a space that was also um, allowing for an imagined self and um, and a sort of ideal self but was also presenting another side I think to um, to South Africa um, in terms of South African photography of a very specific time um, you know also in thinking around um, photographers that come that came before me that from South Africa where a lot of it was really very much social documentary photography um, um, images that were against um, the struggle against apartheid, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, sort of a lot of photojournalists that, that I, or photojournalist images that I'd sort of come across. And so, you know, really contrasting what I grew up with, which were the only really Im images that I was exposed to were these images in the family photo albums. Mm -hmm. And so I, I began to think about those two the, the two ways of photography um, from, from the South African context and both of them really becoming around um, or being about resistance, in, in, mm. but in two very different ways. Mm. Um, and so I, I think I went around. <laughs> you you, you um, cued at my next question perfectly, okay. so thank you. <laughs> well, I had been um, maybe anticipating questions because of conversations that we've had with um, various colleagues and visitors over the past week or so, is this idea of the, the social impetus or the social role of, of the artwork or as of artist even. Um, you mentioned um, the documentary tradition in South Africa, which we know is incredibly strong and is in large part linked to the Market Photo Workshop, which was founded at the end of the 1980s by David Goldblatt with a, with a strong social message about representing um, particularly the black South African experience and the violence of apartheid. You studied at the Market Photo Workshop 20, 30 years later? 20, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and I'm, I'm just curious, I have a related question to see, but I'm, I'm curious to know how your attitude personally um, has changed and if, if between you and your peers there is a, um, actively a kind of resistance to that message of, of the social function of the work. Well, I wouldn't say that it's a, it's a resistance as it is. I think it's a really different moment mm -hmm. um, that, um, th that when we entered the market for workshop that we're finding ourselves in. So from, you know, the, the, the agenda of, of starting the space was an important agenda. Um, also of giving um, black people who otherwise not have the, the opportunity to study photography, to have access to photography, to be able to document their own communities um, in the sort of fight against apartheid. And so, you know, sort of coming or even sort of post apartheid, so coming in in a moment um, where at the sort of role of, to some degree, the sort of role of photographers and especially I think my generation, um, our questions were really different. And so mm -hmm. our questions I think had a lot to do with um, different conversations around um, identity. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so for me, looking at my identity by engaging an older generation, I mean, so it was a different way I think of still speaking about our history of still addressing social issues, um, but it wasn't, we weren't taking photos um, of, you know, 
um, the same the same the same sort of photos as um, a person like David Goldblatt and mm. um, and the people that have sort of come through the market photo workshop mm. in the moment when it was created for a very specific agenda, mm -hmm. but it was still you know I st it's still falling under social issues and the fact that it you know for me I'm still looking back at these um, the sort of legacy of apartheid and it's still questions around um, around apartheid. Mm. Thank you. Sue, how does that resonate with you? I'm thinking specifically about the fact that those, um, you're part of a generation who received almost like a call to action in the early 1980s with the um, Conference for Culture and Resistance. And obviously time has passed since then. So how has, how was that message received by you at the time and how has it evolved in your work? Yes, well, you mentioned that conference. I think if we look at the history of apartheid in South Africa and think of 1976 as the year that the students in Soweto rose up against the apartheid government. You can think of that as the beginning of the end, if you like. It was mm -hmm. the, largest, the largest signal that the apartheid government had received that, they, that the unrest had reached a point of boiling. And um, there was a conference in Cape Town in 1979 called The State of Art in South Africa. That was really the first one at which artists came together and which we signed a petition that we would not allow our work to be shown in any government-sponsored exhibition again until the universities were open to, to people of all races because at that point the universities were open to whites or there were separate universities for black students. And, um, but a much more significant conference was one which took place in 1982 in Botswana, in Khabarone, um, organized by a group called the Medu Ensemble, and a group of activists who were busy making um, material, posters, and all kinds of things against apartheid. And the title of the conference was, I think it was Culture and Resistance Towards Social Development in South Africa. And this was really, in a sense, the first directive that had been given, that artists had, which was really from the African National Congress, who were, of course, banned at the time, that we were, we were to consider ourselves as having a, a very strong social responsibility, um, that as artists, we shouldn't consider ourselves privileged if we'd had an art training, that art was for everybody, um, that people should feel themselves free to express their feelings in murals, in printing t-shirts, in all kinds of different ways. And yeah, that we had this responsibility to try to bring about change. And as white artists, even though obviously we could not um, present the black experience from people who were inside that, it was our job to document, to record, and to bear witness. So I think that was where part of the impulse well, it was the impulse that led me to kind of interview people who were involved directly in the struggle and to make this first series a few South Africans. Mm -hmm. Just one final question. How do you think that has continued over the past, um, over the past years as your work has evolved? Well, how it's continued, as Lebo, Lebo Khang says, I mean, th things changed. I mean, one doesn't always have, as the situation is fluid, and in fact, um, my work still tends to work in the area of social development, but not always. Mm. I mean, I've done a lot of work which we haven't discussed mm. in this conference, which has gone on outside the borders of South Africa. Mm. And, but I think it's still the human element and what people say that interests me more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you both. I think it's, we have um, about 50, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and we'd love to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We will pass you this magic box, which will magnify your voice and allow our guests to hear you. That's the way it matches James's shirt. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. We have a question over here. said it was magic. I uh, enjoyed the talk and uh, I noticed that 
Uh, Le Bohong, when you spoke about the, I think it was a lighthouse picture, you mentioned that uh, it was accompanied by some music. And for many of us, uh, music also triggers our memory. And I'm wondering if, as you proceed with your work, if there's any particular music, you or Sue, that works along with your memory. So for example, uh, Sue, when you mentioned District 6, I thought of Hugh Masekela, and I thought of uh, Manenberg by Abdul Ibrahim. And I'm wondering if that may be true of either of you. Um, so, so the two films that are in the exhibition, um, there's, we've, we've commissioned musicians, um, and I mean the, the conversations are quite extensive in terms of um, what music, the sort of music that they're composing, um, and the particular period, um, and so the sonic is quite present, especially in the film works. Um, but the, the other works, um, like the patchworks or the, the photographs, those are really silent pieces. Um, you know, I think also because it, it really is, so the work has a lot to, or references a lot of the conversations that me and my family are having. And so the conversation to some degree comes through in the titles of the work. Um, or yeah, in the titles of the works or in the captions of the works. Um, by, you know, by them being the sort of Sutu titles, um, by some of them taking from some of the statements maybe from, from the conversation. And so the oral and the sonic are sort of present um, in the works in different ways. Yeah. Well, the music for me, I mean, as you say, it, um, particularly musicians like Abdullah Abraham, but I mean, District 6 was very, very well known for the musicians that it produced. And in fact, the Lost District on this exhibition is accompanied by headphones which are around the corners. And if you put those on, you can hear a tape that I made in 1981, which is the voices of people in District 6 at that time. Some are happy, some are very angry at the state. But there are also the songs, they're the songs from the carnival and there's the wedding singer singing the song that she would sing at weddings, and you'll hear those fragments of song as well, which were very much a part of District 6 life. Thank you. Yes, here in front. So, many thanks for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I was curious how you see the role of your art as, as female artists and shining a spotlight on women, uh, contributing to healing and potentially reconciliation in South Africa. What role should your art play? What role do you hope it plays? That we, we talked a little bit about resistance, but I'd like to hear about the, the healing and reconciliation work that's obviously still ongoing. Well, I'm a person who believes that in talking things out, one can reach healing um, I think it, it comes through, in the series No More Fairy Tales, the videos, there's one that may be screened at some point later as a separate part of this exhibition called um, It's a Pleasure to Meet You, which is a conversation between Sia Mgaduka and one of his um, peer group, a young woman called Candy's Mama. Both of their fathers have been killed by the same apartheid policeman, as a matter of fact and they're discussing it, and Candice talks about how she went to jail to visit um, this man, Eugene de Kock, and how she hugged him and told him she forgave him. And Sia, who's hearing this for the first time, can hardly believe his ears, and says, they, they, he challenges her on, on this, and he obviously can never, he says he, he, he doesn't feel the same, he doesn't see how he could forgive because if he did say I forgive you it wouldn't mean anything because he wouldn't really have forgiven. And in the second one he sort of moved on, it was made several years later and he's talking with his mother and he has reached a point of greater understanding. So that I do believe that these um, family conversations and conversation generally can bring a certain amount of healing and closure. 
Um, I think that healing is definitely at the core of, of my work. Um, I mean, the work specifically around my family history sort of started with the loss of my mother. And so this journey is, is about, um, is about my, my journey of healing, um, but also my, you know, my journey of healing through conversations with my grandmother um, and my sister. And so, you know, going on this, this journey has very much been a journey for the three of us through conversations, but also through going to the exact locations where my mother was photographed, um, you know, you know, engaging on who's in this, these photos, um, what do you remember about them? And so, so much has happened, I think, um, you know, between the three of us that I think has, has allowed some sort of healing and some sort of conversation that would have otherwise not taken place um, around, um, you know, the loss of my mother and what that meant for my grandmother who'd, also, who'd lost a daughter in the process. And so, yeah, and so I think that the journey of healing has really happened through, through conversation. from our audience. Uh, we have a question from our online audience uh, continuing this theme of healing. Uh, this question is pointed to you, Lebo. Uh, Lebo Hang, can you speak about how your work and process demonstrate a healing framework ingrained in collective African historical experiences and communal cultural heritage? Um, you know, I think my, 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 my biggest question, I think, also around, um, around the family, the family structure had a lot to do with, you know, the absence of, so I, I don't know if I really had felt the absence of, of my father, um, I, before, before the, you know, my, before my mom passed away. And so, you know, questions around, um, sort of the missing father figures in in our, in our communities um, became quite quite important in that moment and and so this journey of trying to to explore um, or engage my family on you know the the men that weren't weren't present in the family um, had also led me to sort of thinking through the history of, of apartheid and the sort of separation of families that took place um, because of apartheid. And so, yeah, and so I think that the journey has really been more than just about my personal healing, um, but really it's been a, you know, journey of really collective healing um, through conversation again. Um, as Sue was mentioning, that I, you know, I, there's so many conversations that took place between myself and my uncles, myself and um, and my aunts and my grandmother um, that I don't think um, I would have really understood why they, you know, they weren't why they were absent fathers, how it had taken place beyond what um, what I'd read. Any other questions? Yes, you. Wonderful talk, absolutely beautiful. My question can be directed towards both of you, and it's actually on, um, so we had actually all been talking about this, but fragmentation of memory through stress and trauma when we're thinking of these colonial situations then coming undone or becoming renewed in the modern day. And so my question is around how trauma fragments memory and what's able to be even recollected in a meaningful way, so the ways in which we then start to self-curate. Um, so when we were talking about how the family album is one that is different than something, like it's what is the work of that? And I think Bell Hooks talks about the act of curation and black family albums, specifically in black American contexts, but how it is to try to reinvent oneself given circumstance, reinvent oneself outside of the gaze of um, oppressive forces and or colonial forces. And so I wonder for both of you, but specifically for Lebanon, how you see this work being done in your own recreation and reconnection to family through albums, like what kind of work is being done there that then confronts these kinds of wounds? Um, I mean, I think what, what the work also allowed me to do specifically the work around my, or the images that I went, that I, uh, my mother's images, um, was also to be able to see her in many different lights. 
um, you know, because I'd sort of only known her as mother. And so to be able to see her, I mean, there's photos of her where she's like in her lingerie, and which I found really interesting in the sense that um, also seeing my aunt's photos, which were very much similar, um, but also because in my family, we never had a, a camera. And so, you know, they relied on a street photographer to have their photos taken. Um, and so the photos that, you know, where they, all of these women are in their lingerie, this one photographer was basically taking these photos. And so, um, and so I found, uh, there were so many things that I found quite, quite fascinating also about the sort of access to photography, but, you know, the, the intention of really performing, um, which, which I found quite interesting and really relating that to, um, you know, the space where you could almost, where you didn't have to, not didn't have to, but a space where you could project, you know, um, an ideal self, which is not who you are. And so that's what I found really interesting around this, this idea of, um, of memory and fantasy and how that almost lives in, in within the space of family photo albums. Um, Well, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I made a few South Africans in the first place. Because, you know, I wasn't dealing with my own family history, but I was trying to put into the world images of women that I felt were important in South Africa. And I made them first as artworks, these screen, screen printed etched portraits. But I also wanted to get them out into the community, so I made them into postcards and those postcards became really quite important they were just distributed all over the place in fact I saw a photograph of the Mandela Museum in Soweto the other day and I see there's a set of them up on the wall and they just became these little icons that people could they had a little story about the women on the back of each one so I, it was just a way of, of, of kind of activism if you like of getting images out on the street of people who could serve as heroines and inspire the community you know that so I, it's not really a direct answer to your question but it's a, an answer to what role do, to do photographs play in the community and in healing i think we have time for one more anyone oh back here Um, first off, I just, you know, want to thank y'all so much for sharing your work and your personal stories and the stories of um, bearing witness to stories within the South African community. I just had a question um, as uh, what, mm, thinking about young people and young people who are, mm, uh, trying to develop their own voice or developing develop their own craft what would be a message you would like young people to walk away from either with your work or from your personal experience in terms of either encouraging voice or finding healing within doing this sort of work I don't know if that's speaking to a younger version of yourself or just talking to uh, the current generation I, I don't know if that makes sense either but yeah, if there's a message that you would give to young people right now. Well, I would say to young people, young artists who are starting out in the world and who've just finished, stop worrying about being rich and famous within five years. <laughs> and think about what is really important to you. What is the most important thing in your life? What interests you the most? What would you like to pursue? What would you like to share from your own experience, your own interests? and work on that? Um, so one of the discoveries in one of the conversations that me and Sue, Sue had um, that we made was, um, so Sue comes from a journalism background, right? Um, and, um, and I'd intended on studying journalism when I finished school because I wanted to, to be a writer and I thought to be a writer you had to study journalism, even though I was interested in African literature. Um, and, you know, I think so many, so many years later, um, I have 
come to realize that what photography allowed me to do, or studying photography by chance in the way that I did, what it's allowed me to do was to incorporate all of my different interests. So my, my interest in sort of writing and storytelling um, or African literature, but also my interest in, in performance. So I, I would say that we all have uh, our own sort of language or visual language, and it does take time, I think, to find your own visual language. Um, and how that happens also is in you not wanting to do the same thing as someone else. You know, I think that we all have different stories to tell and we all have important stories to tell. And it's just a matter of, you know, time that allows you to find your own sort of visual, um, or own language of, uh, of communicating your story. All right, well, I will take these final moments to let you know that this conversation continues or is expanded in a beautiful full color catalog that accompanies and supplements the exhibition that you can find in the store across the hall here. Um, and also, if you want to continue listening to a similar conversation, Sue is teaching a class here at the Barnes online virtually, a four-part class called um, Art and Apartheid, Correct. where Sue will invite different artists um, her colleagues uh, who and speak about art in apartheid, post-apartheid, South Africa. Uh, can we have a round of applause for our guests here? colleague James Claiborne. Thank you, TK. Uh, a hand for TK. He's done so much incredible work in this exhibition. And thank you to all my Barnes colleagues that are in the room, Maggie, Julie, Tamir, our friends in the AV booth. Uh, it's, it's wonderful serving alongside you. Um, your attendance tonight also comes with access to this exhibition, so we do hope that you will spend a little time uh, with Sue and Levo's work while you're here. Also, our collection is open and available to you. Um, because the exhibition officially opens tomorrow, uh, those of you who have not yet become members of the Barnes, and we do welcome you to become members of the Barnes. You could probably talk to my colleague Maggie in the back, who would love to talk to you about those benefits. Um, you're, you have access to the member preview that's happening today, um, just to facilitate your entry into um, into the exhibition. Tell me what you remember. You will want to have your ticket for today. When you uh, head into the gallery, there'll be a welcoming uh, guest representatives uh, standing at the gallery door. If they stop you before you enter and ask about membership, do let them know that you were registered for today's talk and they may ask to see your ticket. If you have any questions about any of that, please feel free to see a Barnes colleagues. We'd love to help you navigate. So thank you for being here. Have a beautiful and safe Saturday. If any of you are interested as well, tomorrow we have our, our monthly Pico Free for Sunday Family Day. Uh, that is a day that's free and open to the public. Um, so you may be able to attend that program as as well. Our theme is the art of math. So thank you for being here. Have a great and beautiful weekend and we'll see you next time.